right yeah. there. Okay. Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, the 15th uh, of June, 2010. My name is Larry Harris. I'm a volunteer at the, here at the Palm Springs Air Museum in Palm Springs, California. Uh, part of our mission is to record and reserve the history of our military conflicts, especially during World War II. I was part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress. We conduct interviews with both ex-servicemen and with civilians uh, who participated in these conflicts. Today we have the honor of interviewing Mr. Ken Johnson, Mr. Johnson, and we'll talk to him about his life and his military experiences. Nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, to keep the record straight, would you pronounce your, and spell your name and your birth date? The full name is Kenneth Roberts Johnson. You want me to spell it out? K E N N E T H R O B E R T S J O H N S O N. I was born uh, April 27th, 1925, which makes me just about 85. Good. Now let's start at the beginning. Okay. Where were you born? When? In what circumstances? Well, let's see. Born in San Francisco. My parents uh, were third generation Californians. My mother had uh, been living in San Francisco at the time of the earthquake, so she went through the earthquake as a youngster. My dad was uh, uh, the youngest of a large family of uh, San Francisco natives that, uh, uh, well, his, his father apparently was a sea captain, mm -hmm. and somewhere along the line, uh, she, he deserted the family, so my dad was living in uh, in uh, a uh, orphanage in Vallejo at the time of the the earthquake, mm. so that's their background. My uh, the family is basically uh, Swedish and uh, and Welsh, and that's the reason for the Roberts middle name. <laughs> uh, that was I was I grew up in Berkeley. I didn't. Uh, I guess the family moved to uh, Oakland after right after I was born, and then. Shortly after that, they moved to Berkeley. So I grew up in Berkeley, went through the Berkeley school system, and when I graduated from Berkeley High School, I went to uh, Marin Junior College for one semester. And uh, the reason I was inducted in the Army, I was ready to be drafted anyway, so this group of, uh, of recruiters came to the college from this organization, the 914th Engineers Air Force Headquarters Company, and they were recruiting youngsters that were in college to become, mm. that they were ready to be drafted anyway, to become members of this, uh, this organization. And they needed people that uh, had engineering background. So that's why I mm. signed up with them and was in, uh, ultimately uh, drafted in the Army in July of 1943. Your major was engineering then? Yes, at, at mechanical that time. engineering. Uh, what, just jumping back into your earlier childhood, anything that stands out on your, as far as your upbringing and your hi family history and so forth that would be of interest? To oh, not too much. They were California natives. Uh, my dad had a, an iron foundry and he had been in, yeah, on the per perimeters of engineering. I don't think he had ever, ever had uh, more than a high school edu education, but he was a real entrepreneur, mm. much more so than I. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, <clears throat> now, when you went to college and then you went from college right into the service then yes. before you had completed yes, your, right. your training, uh, where was that and where did you go at the very initial? Uh, okay, oh, well, from uh, Berkeley, I, I, I guess my dad drove me down to Monterey where the induction center was. And uh, after a few days, I was sent to the company, the 914th engineers, up in, uh, uh, I guess it was Redding. And we had basic training up there. They did their own, we did their basic training at the company rather than at the, you know, uh, the, to, Monterey or one of those mm -hmm. places. It was kind of informal. It uh, 
wasn't really the kind of a basic training that you, that the Army was uh, normally uh, using on the, the inductees. It was sort of a, a haphazard. Yeah. You know? Okay, so well, I, I joined the, uh, the organization in, I guess it was Reading, and from Reading, they, they were billeted at one of the little emergency Air Force uh, landing fields. Uh, and uh, thought the, the only thing I can remember is that they were uh, tar paper barracks, and that during the summer they were pretty damn hot. And uh, they they trained us basically in what uh, kind of work they were going to be doing overseas. This uh, these organizations, these companies, were set up to be uh, sort of a general purpose. Uh, adjunct to the uh, each Air Force. Each one of the Air Forces had one. The 8th had one. The 5th Air Force had one. And uh, there was an engineering platoon that uh, did uh, survey work, map work, uh, drafting, that sort of thing. There was a reproduction group that was uh, set up with uh, big van traders and they had uh, full photo labs. They had a offset printing set up. And they were set up to do anything that the Air Force needed in the way of propaganda, mm. propaganda leaflets or map work, that sort of thing. <coughs> Did you feel your training was adequate? To oh yeah, I, I knew pretty much what I was supposed to do and I knew how to do it. So mm. it wasn't a big learning curve as far as that was concerned. Uh -huh. yeah. <coughs> then when, when and where were your orders cut for after your training? Well. We uh, went from California up to McCord Field, and then from McCord Field back down to the embarkation at uh, Vallejo, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure, can't remember. And then uh, one night we were put on the ferry and uh, shipped over to San Francisco where we got on board the, uh, it was a, a, a almost brand new Dutch liner, the New Amsterdam probably was not more than a year or so old, that the uh, uh, U.S. Army had, uh, I guess they had rented from, mm -hmm. from, the, uh, from the Dutch to use as a, as a uh, troop transport. Mm -hmm. So that night, we, uh, after we were loaded on board, we uh, took off for uh, Sydney, all by ourselves. Not high, in a convoy? High speed? Mm -hmm. No, it was fast enough so that yeah. it presumably would outrun any submarines. Uh -huh. And about the only, th only exciting thing that happened over uh, on the way over was uh, one moonlight night there were these streaks of light phosphorescence coming toward the ship and we're, everybody thought they were torpedoes but they happened to be porpoises. <laughs> but it was a pretty quiet uh, trip over. We went from San Francisco to New Zealand and picked up a uh, contingent of uh, how Australian did, troops. How long troops. were you? Did and then that over to Sydney. Yeah, how long did that take you to get to New Zealand? Oh gosh, half a, about 10 days I would say, mm. a week to 10 days. Yeah, that was pretty fast. Yeah, for yeah, oh yeah. It was probably one of the faster liners. Yeah. Going. And how many were aboard? Do you have any idea of your, of your I have group? no idea. The, oh. the ship was crammed with, mm -hmm. with troops. Um, and I guess the other exciting thing was going from New Zealand to us to Sydney. It pretty rough in that strait, and uh, everybody was seasick. About except about half a dozen of us. And what we were doing was it was raining, it was stormy, so we were up on the on the deck. And as the ship went went down, we'd run as fast as we could and and, and skid down the wet wet decks. But it was uh, pretty exciting. Uh, <laughs> stormy trip across from uh, <coughs> New Zealand to Sydney. Yeah. Now the typhoons in those areas were no fun. Well, this wasn't a typhoon. I think it was just a bad storm. Heavy season, it, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't a typhoon. Yeah. I, I've been in a typhoon yeah. and it wasn't that. Okay, when you reached Sydney, then what? Okay, they, uh, we were billeted at a place called, uh, well, it was one of the uh, racetracks. Paramata, I think it was, outside of town. Mm. And uh, we were just being held there until they could arrange transport up to New Guinea. 
and uh, well, the, the next exciting thing was that uh, the dock workers at Sydney were all on strike, so the company was brought down to the docks to unload ships. So I did that for one day, and the master sergeant took pity on me and sent me to the to the uh, uh, well, it was a Red Cross pilots rec recreation center. The pilots mm -hmm. would come down from New Guinea for R&R. &R. So my job there was to answer the telephone and to uh, wash dishes and a few things like that. Much better duty. Much better duty. <laughs> and then we went up to, uh, to Brisbane by train and we were at a place called Eagle Farm, I think, another racetrack. Mm -hmm. And we were there for a little while waiting for a uh, ship to take us up to uh, New Guinea. And finally a uh, they put us on board a Dutch coastal freighter, and uh, what they did to assign beds was to lead us past a pile of quarter-inch plywood, four by eight sheets of plywood, and that was our bed. You could put it in down any place on the deck it's true that you were, <laughs> that you were comfortable. <laughs> so anyway, we we took. Uh, I don't know, two or three days to get up to uh, Milne Bay, and we were there overnight, and then they took us up to Ley, then offloaded us on uh, the lighters to bring us ashore. And uh, on the way from Sydney, from uh, New Zealand to Sydney, one of the Australian officers had given us a lecture on how to prevent getting tropical diseases. So he said, always wear your mosquito netting and so on and so forth. So as we came ashore, we walked through, it was an evening, we walked through a, a camp of guys, and they were all in their skivvies laying on their bunks. So, so much for all the protection, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, the prevention of uh, any kind of malarial diseases. Anyway, we went to NADSA from Ley which is just inland, oh. it's a big Air Force field, and that's where we set up a camp. And then we were there for about, uh, I don't know, six months or so. Mm -hmm. And we were, uh, we had assignments short trips away, for example, up to the north coast of New Guinea, a place called Sador, to do some survey work. And what they would do is they'd fly us in, and we would do our survey work, and then we would fly out. What was the survey for? Or what? Oh, roads. Uh, Airfields, encampments, any any survey work that needed to be done, mm. uh, topo work, uh, just conventional survey work. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you from Nadzab, we went to Hollandia, spent uh, not too much time there, and then from Hollandia to a place called Aui, which was a little island off the coast of uh, of Biak, which is in the Dutch East Indies, mm -hmm. and that's where Fifth Air Force was located. And Aoi was a fairly small island. The, uh, the Air Force built a large landing field, that, uh, and the planes would land from the ocean and take off over the ocean. It was just maybe three miles in diameter. Mm -hmm. And we made maps of the island. And then from uh, Aoi, one of the trips I took was to a place called uh, Numfor, which is over in the to the uh, west of the of the Biak and Aoi, and we did survey work there. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, well, I guess the th flying over was C-47. They hauled us around in C-47s. Uh -huh. And it was pretty exciting coming back to Biak because as we were approaching the airfield, uh, a fighter plane came in the opposite direction, so they had to avoid each other. Then from Biak, uh, where did I go? Up to uh, Leyte, and uh, we were placed. We were stationed at a place called Barawan. And the excitement at Barawan was uh, that was about the only place that the Japanese used paratroopers, hmm. and they dropped them on the Fifth Air Force. And after a few days, we uh, they were eliminated, but they were eliminated by a bunch of. Uh, of uh, service troops, you know, cooks and bottle washers and that sort of thing, <laughs> and carpenters. They, it wasn't a really a very 
uh, sterling military operation, but they did get rid of the Japanese uh, paratroopers. That obviously was a surprise to our... It was a surprise. Our, yeah. our I think it was the only time that the uh, Japanese used paratroopers. Mm -hmm. Where did anywhere. they come? How far did they have to fly them in? I don't know. They probably came from somewhere in the Philippines, mm -hmm. but they used Bettys and, and they I don't think they could carry very many in, a, in each mm -hmm. one, in each Betty, but there were probably a 30 or 40 of them that were dropped. Hmm. Did they really feel they could take over the island with that? Uh, well, conflict? they were after the 5th Air Force headquarters, mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess. That was the reason they dropped on mm -hmm. Barawan, because it was the headquarters of the 5th Air Force. They were building a big airfield there. They evidently weren't too well protected for that. Uh, well, apparently they were pretty good sized guys. They were uh, uh, apparently Japanese Marines, the uh, Marine air troop, uh, mm -hmm. paratroopers. Uh, but they were pretty good, which pretty good sized guys. Mm -hmm. They weren't the usual run of the Japanese yeah. military, the, the infantry, which were usually pretty small. Did they come close to getting the headquarters? No, but they sure caused a lot of, a lot of damage, and they killed quite a few guys. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then from there, um, we went to Luzon. We were at. Uh, stationed at the Clark Airfield and uh, oh, I remember coming in on the, uh, it was probably uh, an LST that took us into Luzon, either an LST or a victory ship, I can't remember mm -hmm. which, but going past Corregidor uh, was interesting mm -hmm. and then I walked and going through Manila by truck was interesting seeing all the devastation in mm -hmm. that area and we stayed at uh, Clark for a while and uh, then we went to Okinawa, and we were on a peninsula that that uh, pointed toward a, an, uh, an island offshore, an island called Iishime, Iishime, mm -hmm. and that was where the surrender planes landed, the two ja white Japanese Bettys. So we had sort of a grandstand view of the of the uh, flight of these two Japanese Bettys with a swarm of P-38s and so on. How much longer was it after the invasion did the uh, surrender come? Do you remember that? Uh, oh, I don't remember the sequence too well, yeah. but it was a few days after the surrender was announced that mm. the, that the uh, surrender contingent came down to Aishima, and I think they took them down to Luzon from there. Oh, yeah. So it was sort of a stopping over point. And then from uh, Okinawa, there was a group of us, about probably about six or eight of us, that were flown up to Tachikawa, which, is, which was a uh, Japanese pre-flight training school and experimental aircraft factory. It's about 40 miles to the west of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we landed... How much after the end of the war was oh, that? Oh, this was just a few days after the oh. surrender mm -hmm. was signed. So they, they flew us in on a 47, and as when we got out of the plane, the place was deserted. Mm -hmm. But it looked pretty much like it had just been deserted. Mm -hmm. And so there was nobody there except us. So that we were offloaded from the plane, and the plane took off, and we were left there. So we found a billet and uh, wandered around, and it was interesting going into that experimental aircraft factory because they were working on some fairly sophisticated looking fighter planes and light bombers, and uh, I was uh, assigned to uh, night fire watch. We had big uh, heaters in the wooden barracks to keep the place warm, two-story barracks. And they were still in hostile country in a sense. Even oh, yeah. Though they, oh. oh yeah. And so uh, we had the day off. We were right, we had to stay awake all night to be on fire guard. So we had the day off. So we could and we were allowed to wander around anywhere we wanted to. I think the only restriction was we couldn't go more than 100 miles away from Tokyo, but we could ride the trains. So on the weekend, we had passes, and uh, 
We rode the, tr the Japanese passenger trains. And the, the interesting thing to me was that there was no indication of any animosity. There was no overt uh, act of belligerence or anything like that. And then one day we got a jeep and uh, drove into Tokyo. And when we got near Tokyo, you could see all the devastation. Uh, the only thing that you could see really as to what had happened was that uh, you drive into a small crossroads where there had been a village with maybe a concrete bank or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the bank building was there, the shell was there, but all the rest of the village was completely leveled. And the only thing you, that you, you saw... Firebomb that... Uh, yeah, the only thing that you saw was uh, sort of rusted out corrugated iron that had been the roofing material. Mm -hmm. Then when we got closer to Tokyo, uh, it probably was early in the morning, but the school kids were on their way to school and as they saw us coming in the jeep, there were three or four of us in just one, one jeep, mm -hmm. they, they stopped, lined up, and bowed to us as we went by. And when we got into Tokyo, the devastation was pretty much like the villages. There was not much standing except the shell of various concrete and steel buildings, but everything else is burned out. But when we got into the middle of Tokyo, the downtown area was pretty much completely intact. This is the shopping district, and the, also the, uh, the diplomatic area hadn't been touched. But as we'd come to an intersection in, down, in the downtown area, there'd be a policeman directing traffic, and he would stop, stop traffic in all four directions and to, as our jeep went through. So <laughs> we were treated uh, as uh, very distinguished yeah. visitors, and we parked and walked around the uh, uh, the downtown commercial area, and the uh, high school and college students came up to us, wanted to try their English on us. <laughs> so we went into the stores, had a great time, then we walked around looking at some of the buildings in the uh, diplomatic area the embassy areas, and uh, there was this big building that we went into, it was the, we didn't know it, but it was the Diet building. So we just wandered around that building until one of the caretakers asked us to leave. Okay, then a few days later... Uh, Were you armed during this time, carrying no. sidearms or anything? No sidearms. Oh. No. We would just wander around the hills, talk to the farmers in our broken Japanese. I remember I had a, a, a book of Japanese phrases, and I used the phrase dokudeska because I thought it meant, how are you? But what it really means is, where are you? <laughs> so we, I'm sure that I confused an awful lot of the Japanese farmers. And then a few days later, uh, because I had a lot of points, they, they had a point system, mm -hmm. and you were awarded points if you were in combat areas and so on. And the reason we had a lot of points is because they would move us into a combat area just after the combat, but before the, mm -hmm. the place had, had quieted down and became a, a, back, a back, backwater. Backwater. Yeah. So anyway, I had a lot of points, so they put us on a, uh, a carrier in uh, Yokosuka at uh, Tokyo Bay, near, in Tokyo, and we were uh, shipped back home. Didn't it seem paradoxical that here the war was just recently over and they fought it with f such ferocity and uh -huh. uh, n never to give in and, and would die, and yet here you were a few days after yeah, the end of the war. Yeah, it was yeah. unbelievable. It was an unusual experience. You went from a 100% wartime experience to completely peacetime experience. And nobody, you were never threatened or... Yeah. Never threatened, and, some, and it's, sometimes there would be only two of us on a train. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one day we were trying to get on a crowded train and it was com the cars were completely full and they pulled us through the window so that we could get on the train. Oh. And we rode in baggage cars, and, mm -hmm. but we couldn't go very far, like I said, out. Yeah. we couldn't go very far mm -hmm. outside of Tokyo, but I, we took a lot of trains, rode around, mm -hmm. no problems. But always felt safe. No, uh, no animosity whatsoever.
Hmm. It was a strange experience. Very, yeah. yeah. It's a, almost a miracle. That, yeah. uh, that oh, I, I left out Noomfor. Noomfor was in the Dutch East Indies also. And we went over there for, to do, went, went over there to do survey work. And uh, it was pretty quiet, except that one day we were uh, in the jungle doing some survey work, and uh, I had to stand at what they called a backside when they were doing survey work down mm -hmm. the line. So I was all by myself. And the jungle is pretty quiet usually, but you had a lot of creepy things, <laughs> crawly things going on. And that was, that was about the only experience I felt uh, that I was a little bit spooked. <laughs> didn't, didn't know Except what on, uh, let's see now, on, yeah. this is a disjointed recollection, but on coming back to the company, we were down at the coast on on Leyte, and when the, the paratroopers landed, we took the jeep back to Borowan, and on the way we ran into a small tank on the side of the road. Japanese? No, this was oh. a U.S. tank. It was one of the light tanks. And the guys had, were just getting out of the tank. And as they got out of the tank, a sniper opened up on them. So everybody dove into a ditch. So that, And then the tank lumbered off into the paddies to take care of the sniper. <laughs> that was my only near combat experience. Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> uh, you say you went aboard the Enterprise. Yeah. Uh, and how long were you aboard before they left uh, Japan? Oh, well, probably uh, six or eight hours. They probably oh. left that evening or the next morning. So you... Um, and on the way back, uh, there were two carriers that went in tandem. And on the way, and they had put all the aircraft up on the flight mm -hmm. deck. And we were all on the hangar deck, wall-to-wall -wall cots. Oh, yeah. And they ran into some heavy weather, so they had to move all the aircraft down onto the flight deck, onto the hangar deck. And so I, I spent the rest of the trip sleeping under the belly of a TBF. <laughs> but it got pretty crowded with all the aircraft and all the GIs. I'll bet it did. And then we, we came to San Francisco, docked at Oakland, and my folks were there to meet me, <laughs> took me home. Beautiful sight to see that bridge, wasn't it? Oh yes, that was ex that was quite an experience to go under that bridge again. Yeah. <laughs> Anything uh, that you can remember? In addition, you backtracked a couple times, and uh, anything during that service time that you would don't want to later on say, "I wish I'd have said that" uh, or remembered it. Uh. Oh no, I, I I was saying to you that I have gaps in my memory, and one of the <laughs> gaps I had was that. We were in a place, like, like I mentioned earlier, on Sador on the north coast of, of New Guinea, and did some survey work. And I can remember when we were trying to get home, we walked into a fighter squadron tent area to ask them if they would take us home, if they had any flights to back to Nadzab. And they did, and they put us on a B-25 and flew us back over the Owen Stanley Mountains. Hmm. And all I can remember is that uh, it was cold and very noisy. But the strange thing is I can remember the details of being there, going through that camp and asking for a flight back to Nadzap, but I can't remember how the hell we got to, to Sador or what we were doing there exactly. Strange how your memory yeah. works or doesn't work. There you were, but you don't know how, how yeah. you... Yeah. You then didn't have any way to get home. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah that uh, that's what happens in war, I guess. Well, I, I think it's typical of your memory. You remember only yeah. certain things. Yeah. When you got back to the states, and your folks met you, okay. dockside, that must have been nice. Oh yeah. And then, what was your life beyond that beyond that point? Well, I went back to college, uh, University of California in Berkeley, and from. After I graduated there, I uh, worked in uh, various industries uh, around the California. I worked as uh, in a uh, outfit that did uh, work for the lumber industry, and then I'm, from there I went to Kaiser Aluminum. <coughs> pardon me, Kaiser Aluminum Product Development, and designed things like uh, 
uh, aluminum trash cans and aluminum transmission towers and geodesic domes, structures. Hmm. Then went from there to uh, Aerojet in Sacramento and worked on the uh, Minuteman rocket engine, designed the uh, second stage engine case. Mm -hmm. From there I went to uh, uh, Aerojet's di nuclear division and worked on remote handling equipment. Mm -hmm. And from there to GE where I worked on design of nuclear power plants for General Electric. Mm. And then I retired from General Electric. And you live in Palm Desert now? Live in Palm Desert. Mm -hmm. You never didn't mention marriage, children, or anything? Interesting. <laughs> it's a big part of my life. <laughs> yeah, in 1955, after I'd been out of school for about 10 years, I met a girl that was going to uh, Mills College mm -hmm. in Oakland. And uh, we got to be pretty good buddies. We couldn't stand each other at first. We thought we were both very argu argumentative and, and uh, difficult to get along with, but uh, we've been married for 55 years now. <laughs> you over Three children. You overcame the, hmm? you overcame the obstacle. Yeah, she's a good kid. <laughs> she's real bright. Uh, well, where are your children now? One of them uh, is living in Paris. One of them is in uh, a place called uh, Carbondale, works in Aspen. Mm -hmm. Another is living in uh, Northern California at our cabin in the Russian River country. Yeah, how the families disperse. <laughs> they sure do. Yeah. Do you get a chance to see them? Uh, oh yes, we've uh, been to uh, Europe yeah. many times, uh, staying at her, her apartment in Paris, uh, which is very nice. Yeah. It's lucky to have her there so you can go over it. Oh yeah, makes a big difference. <laughs> I should say it does. Anything else that you would like to add to or? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, you. I had a pretty interesting time in the Army. Mm -hmm. Looking back on it, it was pretty easy duty. Yeah, very interesting story and yeah. tale, really. So what I'll say, we at the Palm Springs Air Museum Thank you for your service and your devotion to duty and for your sacrifices that you made during a lot of the difficult yeah. times. Two and a half years I'd like to have back. <laughs> oh, yeah. We also want to thank you for giving us your time here today and sharing your experiences uh, with us. Uh, and this will be made into a, an informative documentary okay. on a DVD. And uh, we, want, we particularly want to do this. this a, copy, a copy of the DVD will be sent on to Washington. DC for the Library of Congress. Right. And we particularly want to do this because uh, we want to retain the memories of, all, of most of this that men and, and women went through as best possible and this is one way of doing it. Good idea. So we thank you for your time and for your service and your giving of your time. You're welcome. So thank you again Mr. Johnson. You're welcome.
Living History, World War II Stories is told by those who were there. Hello there. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California, standing before our B-17 Flying Fortress. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer Brooke Anderson, and today we have the honor and the privilege of hearing the story of a B-24 waste gunner in the 8th Air Force. Sergeant Frank Peace was a B-24 waste gunner with the 389th Bomb Group flying high over the skies of Europe during World War II. Brooke, uh, how best could a gunner protect the formation? Dave, the uh, waste gunner depended uh, heavily on the pilot to keep a tight formation so that he could fire numerous short bursts at the enemy uh, fighter planes diving through the group itself. Uh, maybe we can kind of see this a little bit. I don't know if that will focus on it very well. Okay, what is this? That's the armor piercing nose of a 20 millimeter cannon that a 109 hit our plane with. Ah. Huh. And then this? That's a piece of flak from an 88 millimeter. On the B 24, you have a de icer boot around the leading edge of the wing. Uh huh. And uh, that was lodged in the de icer boot there. Oh, man. And I pulled that out myself. I've had that for, well, 50 years or more there. And I show that to people, not that I glorify war, but to, just to show what that stuff looks like. All they see is black powder out there in the sky. Oh, yeah. But that's, <laughs> that's right. what you're flying through. And was that flight that got him too? Yes. Oh, I mean, it, was, it just ripped him right across like this, and he spun around and hit me. And then he fell down to the floor. But see, at that altitude, with the temperature 60 below zero, you don't bleed a hell of a lot. Oh, um, yeah. And besides, we had band-aids on the wall almost this big. And oh, uh-huh. They, well, really, they were, they were more like this. And you just rip them out and then put them on him and let him hold it on there. Because I guess with the cold and everything, the, the nerve endings and all were mm -hmm. pretty... Uh, dead, we were still under flak conditions there. Right. And of course you never know how long the flak's going to last or when the fighters are just laying out of range waiting to come in on you. Um, a bullet just missed my head on the right waist because as I said earlier there, on the command deck, which is in front of you there and, uh, and cover the bomb bay. We carried 10 one-gallon cans of hydraulic fluid. To Lawrence, we got some hydraulic fluid leak somewhere because it's running on clear down to the camera hatch. And he came back and he said, yeah, you're right, Frank. Uh, we've got a hydraulic leak somewhere. So he checked all the instruments. And everything checked out fine. And we never could find until we landed. And remember the temperature. Well. On one gallon can up there on top of the deck, it only had frost halfway up on it. All the rest of them had frost all the way. And we picked it up and shook it, and a little 30 caliber bullet had gone in and lost it and, and punctured it halfway down, and that, that much fluid ran out. One of the odd stories, and that went right over my head. I shot down a plane at Kiel there's the bombers right right here, and he, he came in, uh, it was a 109, and it must have been a fairly uh, green pilot or something there because he, he didn't break away soon enough. Normally they would come in and then they'd peel off and roll down like that. And he didn't, and I gave him a couple of bursts there, and smoke and everything else poured out of the plane then immediately, and I said, Hey, Neff, I've got one at 4 o'clock back there. Check him out. And he did. And uh, that's, the, that's the only... I had another instance, though, 
where a Falk Wolf 190 came in to our formation. I mean, came right in. But uh, I watched him and he was wobbling like this. Honest to God, he wasn't any more than a hundred feet away, and he was dead. Somebody had already shot him. I did. I could have blown him up because at that time we were using API, armor-piercing incendiary bullets. But I said, if he comes this way, he'll take us with him. Oh, yeah. And I left him alone, and he, he peeled off in that direction and went down by himself. I can see that as if it happened yesterday. You may contact the Palm Springs Air Museum at 760-778-6262 for more information concerning the Veterans History Project. We're happy to interview any veteran or civilian who participated in any of our country's military conflicts and will provide a DVD of the interview for the family. Join us next time for more exciting true stories of World War II. The Palm Springs Air Museum houses one of the nation's largest collections of World War II flying aircraft, displayed in modern, well-lighted, air-conditioned, and spotless hangars. Friendly, knowledgeable docents, many of whom are World War II veterans, are always on hand to assist you in your visit. Our Buddy Rogers Theater shows daily documentaries about military aviation with an emphasis on World War II. Complementing our extensive displays, the museum sponsors Saturday commemorative programs, often including demonstration flights of our aircraft. We have more than 20 World War II vintage military aircraft, including the F-4F Grumman Wildcat, flown by the Marines at Guadalcanal, the Curtis P-40 Warhawk, flown by the Flying Tigers in China, the SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber, flown by Navy carrier pilots at the Battle of Midway, and the B-17 Flying Fortress. The B-17, the C-47 and the PBY are usually open for visitors to tour. Our three hangars include the Don and Peggy Cravens European Hangar, housing mostly Army Air Corps aircraft, including the B-25 uh, Mitchell, famous for the Doolittle Raid. The Bob Pond Pacific Hangar, housing mostly Navy and Marine aircraft, including the Gullwing F-4U Corsair, flown by Pappy Boyington's Black Sheep Squadron, and the Tom Phillips Strategic Bombing Hangar, housing the B-17 Flying Fortress, the Miss Angela. The walls of the hangar display aviation art in the form of paintings and murals by Stan Stokes and other prominent artists, including Stan's large mural of the Tuskegee Airmen located in the European hangar. There are 10 computerized flight simulators upstairs in our library area where visitors can take off and challenge enemy aircraft to dogfights. The library itself houses well over 6,000 books on military history mainly World War II, and aviation, as well as many original flight manuals and maintenance manuals. Researchers will find a wealth of information here. A docents can often find information about a loved one who may have been a veteran. In addition, the library has accumulated every issue of Life magazine from the very first issue in November of 1936 through the end of 1949. 782 issues, all in and around World War II. Our audiovisual section houses some 500 individual DVDs of each of the oral histories we have recorded since the year 2000. Again, please contact the museum for more information concerning the Veterans History Project. The museum is located on the east side of the Palm Springs Airport at 745 North Gene Autry Trail between Ramon Road and Vista Chino. The telephone number is 760-778-6262. The museum is open daily from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Again, that number is 760-778-6262.